Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us today uh, as a part of the Total Health Advancing Care Through Education Symposium. We're going to be talking today about global perspectives and sharing experiences uh, in treating CML through the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, today we're very fortunate enough to have uh, some, some experts from around the world to sort of share our experiences and perspectives in each of the different countries as we all went through the COVID-19 pandemic and treated our patients with chronic myelogenous leukemia. And so I'll start from the right to left. We have Dr. Hemant Malhotra, who is from the Sriram Cancer and Super Specialty Center in Jaipur, India. He's going to give us his perspectives on uh, treating CML during the pandemic from India. Uh, next, we have Dr. Fabio Santos uh, from the Albert Einstein Hospital in Brazil, in Sao Paulo. So we're happy to have him and share his experiences. And then I'll try to share some of our experiences here in Houston in the U.S. Uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic and how we sort of dealt with uh, new patients that came in with COVID and answer some of the questions that we all had. And again, we were all learning on the job, uh, but I think it's important to uh, share our experiences and then and then and, and share them with you uh, to see if we can uh, learn something from each other. Um, overall, what we've tried to do is um, uh, bring up a, a few cases, a few instructive cases of uh, patients with CML, whether they be newly diagnosed frontline, whether they be uh, patients who had blast phase, uh, patients who uh, were on TKI and then developed COVID, uh, whether or not to get a vaccine. So I think a case-based discussion will really allow us to focus our attention and, and, and answer some important questions. And so we've tried to divide it by into diagnostics. Uh, so how to accurately and timely diagnose a patient with CML during the pandemic, uh, how to minimize the hospital visits and exposure to other patients, and other people, uh, and how we did that uh, through the pandemic, uh, how to select treatment. Is there a preferred tyrosine kinase inhibitor that we use for patients with COVID um, and CML? Uh, is there a role for cytoreduction? Can there be drug-drug interactions between the TKIs and some of the medicines that are used uh, for treating the COVID-19 uh, pneumonia? And, and finally, monitoring, right? Um, I think one of the big advances that we've all been able to take advantage of is the use of telemedicine, video uh, visits, chat visits, and realizing that potentially we don't necessarily need patients to be there as frequently as we're seeing them and can we utilize some of these new uh, methods of telemedicine and virtual visits to manage toxicity, uh, to avoid uh, cytopenias, and also to ease the frequency of the visits? And so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to hand it off to Dr. Malhotra, and he's going to take over and uh, talk about uh, some of the cases from uh, the perspective of India. Thank you, Dr. Malhotra. So hello, everybody. Uh, uh, please permit me to introduce myself. My name is Dr. Hemant Malhotra. I've been a medical oncologist for more than 30 years. Uh, I work at a tertiary cancer care center in Jaipur in India. And as Dr. Kadia mentioned, uh, today we're going to talk about how each one of us in our part of the world deals with uh, patients of CML uh, in this pandemic time. And I'd like to start with the disclaimer, you know, this is unprecedented time. This is absolutely uncharted territory and uh, we actually do not know uh, what is the right way forward and things are evolving uh, but this is the consensus we have in my country and consensus driven, derived from uh, uh, you know inputs from all over the world as to how to approach uh, patients with CML and COVID-19. We are a huge country 1.3 billion people and as a consequence a very large number of patients with CML. So really thankful to Total Health for this initiative and to share our experience with you. So what uh, the three of us, Dr. Kedia, myself and Dr. Fabio have decided that we will have these four case scenarios and each one of us will present to you how we deal with that in our country. So I will present what we do in India uh, and these might be my own opinions, not the opinions of all the medical oncologists or hematologists in my country. And then Dr. Atapan will talk about the US perspective and Dr. Fabio about the perspective in Brazil. So let's come to the first question. This is a patient who's come with symptoms of chronic myeloid leukemia, large spleen, uh, pH and BCR level are positive, newly diagnosed patient. Uh, and this patient is, uh, you know, how do I approach this patient in India? So a newly diagnosed patient, uh, the bottom line is that uh, the patient should get out of his or her house the minimum. 
so that the chances of contracting the virus, contacting the virus are the least. So as far as possible, all indicated tests, including the marrow aspiration and biopsy, collecting blood for uh, BCR, able BCR, uh, should be done on uh, one trip. Try and organize, uh, we try and organize our team to do everything in one shot. And once the diagnostic tests are ready, uh, we do uh, want the patient to come one time because a lot of discussions will happen. A lot of uh, you know treatment modalities will need to be discussed, whether the patient is a candidate for a first generation TKI or a second generation TKI. Those things will need to be discussed. Toxicities of the medicines will have to be discussed. So we generally prefer that after seven or 10 days, the patient makes at least one visit. Uh, this can be done by telemedicine also, but uh, at least for one visit for a detailed counseling, once the final diagnosis has been established, we do request the patient to come one time. Uh, so COVID or no with COVID, pandemic or no pandemic, uh, we do not recommend that there should be a delay in TKI therapy. And this is for obvious reasons, uh, because if the patient has very high counts and almost half of the patients in my country have counts in hundreds of thousands, 200,000, 300,000, and you know, these high counts can have leukostasis and may worsen the lung damage gas exchange in case the patient is unlucky enough to contact the virus. And of course, we know that if you delay the TKI too much, then you have the chance of CML uh, progressing to more advanced phases and the complications of hyperleukocytosis. Uh, we normally are very careful in the first three months because uh, we like to make sure that severe cytopenia does not occur. And if this does occur, then it can increase the risk of contacting the virus and, you know, having a much severe infection. So we normally either give a very short course of hydroxyurea uh, or a lower dose of hydroxyurea or sometimes if the counts are not very high, say 40, 50,000, then we don't give hydroxyurea. So the bottom line is that avoid, try and avoid severe cytopenias. Then of course, the standard guidelines uh, need to be followed as per local practices. Uh, my first choice is imatinib, or nilotinib, or bosotinib. Uh, I keep uh, desatinib as my last choice. This is actually a personal preference, possibly not data driven, but I'm a little scared of the potential lymphopenias and the risk of infections with the satinib. So, you know, my personal preference is not to use it upfront as compared to imatinib, nilotinib, and bosotinib. So now what if uh, this uh, newly diagnosed patient is COVID positive? What would I do in my country? So we would follow the standard guidelines for the diagnosis and treatment of COVID. Uh, we would also make sure that, you, that we continue the TKI, whatever TKI the patient is receiving for as long as possible. And we would you know, kind of stop the TKI only if there is significant pulmonary involvement, either by the TKI as a side effect or uh, by the virus. And then we would reinitiate the TKI therapy post recovery as soon as possible. And, uh, you know, uh, all the TKIs uh, have a capability uh, capacity to increase the QT intervals, especially the lotinib. And in some countries and some guidelines, uh, people are still losing, uh, using chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine, and azithromycin as a part of either prophylaxis or treatment of COVID. And when these drugs are anticipated and you also have a TKI on board, then you do have a risk of increasing the QT interval to a level where uh, significant uh, symptomatic and rarely fatal ventricular arrhythmias uh, can happen. So when if you are combining these drugs, uh, HCQ or azithro with uh, uh, one of the TKIs, particularly the allotinib, then extra caution needs to be kept uh, and extra ECG and cardiac monitoring uh, needs to be done. Uh, treatment of COVID is as per institutional and country protocols. Uh, it's symptomatic either at home or in the hospital. And uh, we follow the guidelines in our country. Uh, you know, severe forms of the infection require transfer to the hospital uh, and eventually ICU uh, with oxygen support, with steroid support and with any one of the anti-IL-6 or anti-TMF or other anti-cytokine agents.
but the rule of the thumb for our patients of CML who are unfortunate enough to develop the virus, catch the virus, uh, the TKI should be continued for all, as long as possible and should be you know, stopped only for the shortest possible period of time in patients who have significant lung involvement. Uh, thank you, Dr. Malhotra. Um, I think that, uh, that some of the points you made are, are really excellent and, and mirrored, I think, uh, also in our own experience uh, but with slight differences. But I think that um, uh, I agree with your assessment of you know, using the least sort of cytoreductive uh, TKIs as possible to avoid cytopenias in our patients. But let's take a new patient just like you did with a, a diagnosis of CML and chronic phase who's newly diagnosed, comes in with leukocytosis splenomegaly, how do we do this? And so initially a patient will present, let's say <clears throat> through the emergency room, uh, referred by an outside hospital where they have uh, found on a CBC routine to have significantly elevated white cell count, 50,000, 100,000, 200,000. Uh, they're usually immediately transferred to our hospital, to the emergency room, and then admitted to the hospital. Um, some patients uh, who have lower white counts, potentially in the 20, 10, 20 to 40,000 range, they may be seen as an outpatient clinic, but often just for the, uh, the reasons of expediting treatment uh, and diagnosis, these patients are also admitted to the hospital, even if for a short time. And so I think one of the differences is that in order to expedite the testing, to get everything done on the same day, and potentially even start cytoreduction, we had to admit many of these patients. And, and to be honest, many of these did have white counts above 100,000. So we would admit them, start them on hydroxyurea, get a bone marrow, rapid BCR, ABL, fish, rush the cytogenetics and molecular studies. And then, you know, in order to get the, the TKI here, we had to sort of send expedited insurance approval. And, and to get a TKI here, um, uh, you know, although we have uh, uh, um, access to many of these, sometimes it's difficult to get for an individual patient. The hospitals don't often stock um, more, many of the TKIs. In fact, the only ones we stock in-house here are imatinib uh, and desatinib. And so for the other ones, we'd have to get an outside specialty pharmacy. I think that little bit of delay often um, uh, allows us to potentially choose one TKI over the other uh, and often keep the people in the hospital until their insurance approves so that they can get their own bottle of uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitor pills to take home with them. And so we send the insurance exped expedited approval, start side reduction, and as soon as we have confirmation, we initiate therapy with the tyrosine kinase inhibitor. So I agree with Dr. Malhotra that uh, delaying TKI should not be uh, something that we should do even in patients who are COVID uh, infected. And so in, in patients who are COVID-19 positive, the difference would be that we have a completely separate isolated part of the hospital, uh, sort of the COVID-19 isolation zone where they would be admitted uh, for workup and treatment. Um, and if they needed treatment for COVID, they would start uh, therapy for COVID-19 along with a side of reduction, close monitoring of tumor lysis syndrome, close monitoring of renal function, hydration, uh, and then uh, initiation of the TK when that was available. Now, what about selecting treatment? I think, you know, one of the biggest questions we had in the beginning was, is there one TKI that's, that's preferred over the other? And I think, you know, just again, there may be no right or wrong answer to this because I don't think there's data, but this is all from anecdotal experience and, and just using TKIs for years and decades before that and knowing what the side effects are of each of the individual TKIs and the potential comorbidities of the patient uh, before we start them. And so, um, we would uh, choose based on the patient's comorbidities, based on their condition, uh, and start the TKI as soon as the diagnosis is confirmed. Uh, we would counsel them, monitor them in the hospital while they're there, um, and outpatients were sent home initially with hydrea, and then restarted th and started therapy once their diagnosis was confirmed and their TKI was approved. Uh, in COVID-19 patients here in the U.S., if they needed treatment, if they were hypoxia, had lung infiltrates, were started on remdesivir, they were given convalescent plasma. Steroids were started in those patients who were hypoxic, febrile, and of course, oxygen supplementation. Um, and during the time, I guess, um, in the first or, or second third of the, of the pandemic, we really started uh, um, um, uh, developing more interest in, in the use of anticoagulation in patients with COVID-19 because we were seeing patients who were young and otherwise healthy uh, having blood clots having you know, you know, th uh, either venous thrombosis, in some cases, arterial thrombosis, which may or may not have been related uh, to the COVID-19 infection. And so um, because of that, we had to really be careful about some of the TKIs that could potentially uh, lead to thrombosis, particularly, of course, panatinib, uh, which we have several clinical trials in the front line, uh, but also nilotinib and some of the others. And so 
that played into our decision about which ones to start. And so our TKIs of choice, you can see there, uh, listed sort of in a rough order of where we would go in Matinib, probably uh, our first choice if uh, we were considering a first generation tyrosinkinase inhibitor. Otherwise, basutinib, uh, desatinib, uh, and nilotinib, and they can obviously avoid panatinib uh, given the uh, patients who had COVID-19 positivity. Uh, what about monitoring in these patients? You know, we, uh, as I mentioned in the, in the opening, we try to minimize in-person visits because it would, it would take the patient out of their comfort zone, out of their isolation zone at home. We were really recommending sort of hunkering down at home uh, throughout the majority of the pandemic, staying away from other people. And so coming into the hospital, whether traveling by public transportation, by a car, coming, waiting in the waiting rooms, then coming into the clinic, all that increases their exposure to others and potentially um, can spread the COVID pandemic. And so we tried to minimize in-person visits as much as possible. We did telemedicine and phone calls during months two and three. Uh, again, during month one, they came into the hospital, uh, they were discharged, came back for the one month visit uh, in person. And then after that, during months in three, uh, two to three, we would uh, do telemedicine, both virtual visits and phone calls by myself, the physicians, as well as our mid-level providers like nurse practitioners, nurses, or physician assistants. We also emphasize the importance of education. We really wanted to make sure that the patients themselves could be an advocate for their own treatment and their own side effects. And so we were really heavy on education, potentially even more so than we would in person because we needed an extra set of eyes at home. We would tell not only the patient, but their family members they lived, they, they lived with it. Hey, if you notice any swelling in their face, in their, in their legs, if you noticed that they were more short of breath, they were coughing more, uh, or they're having some bleeding or bruising, please let us know. Um, make sure that they're taking their TKI every day. Um, all these things were, were emphasized uh, potentially even more than we would maybe in person because we were more comfortable with seeing them and managing the side effects. And so that was uh, a learning experience for us. Um, a fortunate uh, in, in the US and many places to have labs locally near people's homes. So these would be like commercial labs like Quest or, and whatnot, where they would go, we would send the order, they would get their blood drawn in a very isolated environment, go home, and that blood result would then be sent to us and then we would review those blood results with the patient while they were stayed at home and kind of make adjustments based on what we thought uh, if they were having response or not. And this includes, incidentally, BCR ABL testing with quantitative RT PCR. So we allowed to monitor those patients. Um, we did an office visit at three months and then te telemedicine after that. Uh, in COVID 19 positive patients, I think the difference would be that initially they would be hospitalized and treated optimally for COVID, sometimes for an extended period of time. Uh, we watch for drug-drug interactions, as Dr. Mohotra brought up, a very important uh, uh, QT prolongation is, is common in many of the TKIs. Drugs like um, uh, macrolides, like Dr. Mohotra brought up, but also quinolones, which we use very frequently in our patient population, can cause uh, prolonged QT and therefore uh, with a risk of, of toxicity. Um, cardiopulmonary toxicities, I think this is important. Uh, many of our patients with COVID-19 had uh, ground glass type opacities in their lungs. You know, pleural effusion wasn't a, a, a feature of COVID-19, but we know that many of the TKIs, particularly dysatinib, can lead to a little bit of volume overload and potentially pleural effusions. And so this was always in our mind when we thought about initiating dysatinib in a person who already had some degree of pulmonary compromise uh, and hypoxia to really sort of avoid dysatinib unless we thought that that was indeed the best choice out of the TKIs that we had, because you don't want to compromise the pulmonary function already, that which is already compromised with an additional pleural fusion or maybe developing pulmonary hypertension later in life. We discharge patients when they're appropriate and then telemedicine fee, uh, visits when feasible again, virtual monitoring for these patients. And so that was sort of our US experience, um, but again, very similar and, and, and um, things to draw upon from, from everyone. Um, I think I'm gonna go over and uh, tag over to Dr. Uh, Fabio Santos from Brazil, Dr. Santos. Uh, thank you, Dr. Cardia. Uh, I'd like to thank Turtle Health for inviting me to this webinar. And I'm a, as Dr. Cardia mentioned, I'm a hematologist here in Brazil. I work at the Albert Einstein and also at a hospital BP. And I'm going to approach, I'm going to tell my approach to a newly diagnosed patient in chronic phase. You're going to see that you have, well, my recommendations are pretty much similar to what, to what Dr. Cardia, Cardia and Dr. Mahalt has have already presented. But overall, if I, have, if I see a patient who has a suspicion for chronic face CML newly diagnosed, 
uh, at the first appointment. I will try to collect all necessary lab work at the first office visit and schedule a bone marrow aspiration as soon as possible. And if necessary, particularly if the patient has high perleukocytosis, I would try to admit the patient to speed up bone marrow aspiration and start cytoreductive therapy with hydroxyurea as soon as possible. And also it's important for to monitor for side effects of side reduction, like tumor lysis, which is not very common in CML, but you, you can see it sometimes. And to limit patients' visit to, the, to a lab to collect blood work, I would try to get uh, lab, lab samples collected at, at home if possible. And here in Brazil, at least in Sao Paulo, uh, where I practice, that is pretty much a reality. Most uh, private labs, they can, uh, with adequate insurance coverage, they can offer to collect lab work at home, and that will uh, make it easier for the patient to uh, do his blood work and not have to frequently go to the hospital. After uh, I, I, I confirm the diagnosis, I'm going to uh, start therapy with a, a TKI as soon as possible. And I tend to stratify patients using SoCal or UTUS score. But here in Brazil, due to insurance coverage, that, that doesn't change my initial pro approach to TKI. Uh, we don't have insurance coverage to start second generation TKI in most situations. So I usually go for imatinib even now uh, in the pandemic. If I had a choice, if, if, if we had availability here, another TKI that I would consider would be bazutinib because I think it has a, a, an appropriate side effect profile uh, for patients in chronic phase. But most of the time I go with imatinib. And I would start scheduling weekly CBCs to monitor for metallurgical response, and then monthly until three months of therapy. And then I would schedule an RT-PCR at three months and discuss response and tolerance to therapy and how we're going to proceed forward. So next slide, please. Now, if a patient was had a simultaneous diagnosis of uh, COVID-19 and CML, and I I even had a case uh, like this uh, a few months ago. In that case, I would admit patient to the hospital for di to speed up diagnostic testing, and I would start cytoreductive therapy with hydroxyurea as soon as possible. I would treat COVID-19 following uh, hospital guidelines, depending on where the patient was admitted to. And I would try to start TKI as soon as possible, preferably with the patient in a COVID unity, and I would consider inter drug interactions with TKI and uh, therapies that are used for COVID, like KT prolongation. And most of the time, I would try to avoid discontinuing the TKI uh, if feasible, unless the patient was very sick and had to be admitted to the ICU and be intubated, etc. So now we come to case scenario number two. Like, you know, just to summarize case scenario number one, if you have a if you have a newly diagnosed chronic myeloid uh, leukemia patient, try to do all his workup as soon as possible so that he <coughs> stays home for as long as possible, gets out of the house as little as possible, and start TKI as soon as possible. If the patient, the newly diagnosed patient, is also COVID positive and has mild or moderate disease, you of course manage the COVID, but also continue the TKI. TKI needs to be stopped only in patients who have severe COVID. So now let's come to scenario number two. This has already been covered by Dr. Kedia, what he would do in the United States. Now you have a patient who's been diagnosed, who is due for his uh, three monthly follow-up. Uh, and, 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 and you know, what would you do then? Would you call him for a three monthly follow-up or would you not? <clears throat> So usually for the patient who is stable, it's a good idea during the pandemic to avoid hospital visits for refill of prescriptions. Uh, whenever possible, telemedicine should be used for reviewing the CBC and the follow-up. Uh, if the patient is in uh, major molecular remission, then you may think of uh, doing the PCRs, you know, uh, six monthly rather than three monthly, so that the patient is less exposed to the virus in the environment. If the patient is not in major molecular response or has rising transcript levels, uh, we try and have the samples collected at the patient's home uh, and sent to the nearest laboratory with the patient having to travel the minimum distance. And prescriptions for TKIs, uh, 
uh, our email or fax or WhatsApp to the patient. And we also, for patients who are living in far off areas, which is not very unusual in India, a patient sometimes has to travel several hundred kilometers to get in touch with his CMR physician. We try and courier the patient's uh, uh, TKIs to him or her. For the patient who plans to go for a TFR, uh, is insisting for a TFR, uh, during the pandemic time, uh, we kind of tried to persuade the patient uh, to defer the TFR till the pandemic is over uh, or is at least on the decline because once you initiate the TFR, then getting a PCR test done for BCR able transcripts is mandatory at least for the first six months every monthly. So to avoid that, to avoid the risk of the patient contacting the virus when he gets to get out, gets out of the house to get his test done, uh, we prefer that the TFR is deferred till the pandemic is over is or, or is on the decline. If the patient is within six to twelve months of initiation of the TFR, then at least my recommendation is to, you know, restart the TKI rather than have the patient come out for his PCR every month. And if the patient is stable past six months or past 12 months, then rather than testing the patient every month, uh, I would ask for a PCR testing done every two monthly or every three monthly, particularly if the earlier PCR is stable and the patient is in uh, molecular remission. Now back to Dr. Kadia. Thank you, Dr. Malhotra. <clears throat> I think that uh, you really uh, sort of set the template of, of what we do in these patients in CML chronic phase. and. And what I'm gonna echo, I think, is many of the same points. I think in follow-up, <clears throat> we really try to convert many of the telemedicines, many of the visits to telemedicine visit when it was appropriate and feasible. So, you know, one of the things that we learned, I think, of the pandemic, and I think it's gonna change our practice even going forward uh, when the pandemic is over, is that, you know, patients don't necessarily need to come as frequently as we see them in person necessarily, particularly when they're further out in their chronic phase and responding well beyond a major molecular remission. And so I think, many of the visits may be converted to telemedicine. And so uh, early in the course, we try to at least maintain that three month visit to confirm milestones. Um, you know, we used to do a lot of bone marrows, uh, particularly because they're on protocol or just to see clonal evolution. We've minimized the, the, the use of bone marrows. We may not do one until six months or 12 months, for example. Once in major molecular, molecular response, as I mentioned, we do uh, telemedicine visits, uh, local collection of CBC and BCR ABL and results are sent uh, electronically, and then we review them over the phone. And uh, like I said, we delay and omit bone marrows that we used to do. Uh, if they're having a suboptimal response, uh, we may do a little bit more frequently on the telemedicine visit and local BCR ABL by IS and um, counsel, educate, try to determine compliance uh, on video visits. And if there is rising PCR or resistance, we'll confirm this with a sort of a frequent, like a monthly PCR to make sure it indeed is resistance, uh, check mutational testing at that point. Uh, and then if there is a need for further workup or change in the TKI, we would schedule a very limited in-person visit in those settings. I think some of the uh, innovations of kind of sending uh, prescriptions to the patient, particularly the, the you know, mailing them the, 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 um, the, the medications and things, I think is, is, is also increasing quite significantly here, as well as we heard in India. So um, that has helped quite a bit to sort of take the day-to-day the, the -day management out of the office and, and more into the home with, uh, with virtual visits. Um, let's see here, next slide. Um, what about uh, treatment discontinuation and TFR? You know, we try, like, a, like Dr. Mahotra said, to try to avoid doing that during the pandemic, particularly when we had a lot of isolation and fewer visits because of their need for frequent monitoring. Um, and, and, and in patients who wanted to go into TFR, for example, but they, we're not able to because you know we, we recommend it against it. One of the things that we would do and we still frequently do is, is reduce the dose of the TKI. So we frequently would go from desatinib 100 down to 50, and in some cases down to 20 people who are in a really deep molecular response or CMR, where we sort of would come to this compromise and say, look, you know, we're not going to stop the TKI. Let's go ahead and reduce the dose of the of the drug and then you know keep monitoring you. And maybe at some point when there is less restriction, we can certainly talk about TFR at that point. So that actually helped uh, many people. The people who are already on TFR, uh, I think in the first six months, we still would continue monthly BCR testing as feasible, but they would get the labs locally. They wouldn't come in and we would monitor them 
by telemedicine. We were at several people actually, we did this and it worked out very well. They would just go to their local lab, get the blood and go right back home. And we would check their PCR sort of on a, on a monthly basis. Um, after the first six months, I agree, we are stretching out the PCRs to every two to three months. And, and people who had T PCR relapse, we'd go ahead and tell them to restart the TK at the former dose and then monitor virtually and, and make changes uh, at that point. So very similar, but again, using really um, leveraging that telemedicine and, and local lab draw to allow to reduce the visits and, and still keep people uh, in remission. And I will uh, now turn it over to Dr. Santos. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Dr. Kadia. So yeah, I fully agree with Dr. Kadia. I think what the pandemic has done for medicine is to speed up the adoption of telemedicine. Uh, that approach has come to stay in my opinion. Here for follow-up, we usually uh, type, uh, orient patients to schedule a follow-up after three months of therapy to access for the three-month milestone response to TKI. From that time point, usually I get patients to draw peripheral blood RT-PCR every three months until they reach major molecular response or MR3. And then every six months, and I, I, as I said in the previous, section, I usually tell patients at, this, at the present time to get the, their labs collected at home. And I follow them with telemedicine vis visits most of the time. If they're doing well, they have no major side effects, the transcript levels are decreasing or stable, if the patient is in a major molecular response, then it's business as usual. Otherwise, if the patient is developing side effects or there is an increase in transcript levels, then I'm gonna increase monitoring and going to ask them to come for office visit if, if feasible to for us to have a deeper discussion of how to proceed. Uh, next slide, please. And if I confirm that the patient is losing uh, response, then I'm going to ask them to, to get uh, AB mutation testing, and then I'm going to discuss which PKI to switch based on the results of the mutation testing, testing their preference, and comorbidities. Usually for most patients here in Brazil, if a patient has failed or has intolerance to imatinib, usually either switch to uh, desatinib or lenotinib. And if a patient has failed two TKIs, then we have a chance to switch to ponatinib. And as for treatment free remission, I agree with Dr. Mahotra and Dr. Kadia. I usually don't advise patients to proceed with treatment discontinuation during the pandemic that we are currently living on. Uh, for those patients who have already started, I tell them to monitor AB, uh, AB PCR able transcripts with monthly PCR until at least six months, and then I decrease frequency of monitoring, and I usually orient similar to the uh, other speakers to for home lab collection and tele use telemedicine visits for monitoring. So now I think I'm going to switch back to Dr. Mahotra. Okay, yeah. so now we come to case scenario number three. We have a diagnosed patient of CML on TKI uh, who is throat swab positive for COVID-19. Uh, what if the patient is requesting a COVID vaccine? What would I do in India? So uh, all newly diagnosed and follow-up patients of CML on TKI uh, should be encouraged to get vaccination COVID-19 as soon as possible. Uh, it is pretty much established that the toxicity of the vaccine is not in excess in the CML patients as in the general population. Uh, so uh, the AEs and the SAEs are just like the general population and we want the general population to be vaccinated. So we would prefer that our CML patients are also vaccinated. For the patient who having active infection with COVID-19, at least in my country, the expert recommendation and the government recommendation is to wait for the infection to get controlled. And we normally wait for a period of two to three months before we advise the patient for vaccination. And I think here the local guidelines are important. And in my country, as I just said, if the patient has active infection, we recommend vaccination uh, uh, three months post recovery. Other than that, if the patient is not COVID positive, doesn't have signs and symptoms, uh, we encourage every single patient of uh, CMLCP to seek vaccination as early as possible. 
same thing. I think uh, the question on case three is, well, if a CML person, a patient with CML in chronic phase who is taking uh, a TKI then develops COVID-19, that's one part, or, 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 or wants a vaccine, you know, how do we manage these patients? So let's start with each one at one at a time. I think a patient with CML chronic phase on TKI who develop uh, COVID-19, you know, we, we kind of really sat down and thought about this carefully because these are otherwise healthy patients. Their counts are usually normal. They're not uh, profoundly immunocompromised. And if they develop COVID, and how do we deal with these patients? And, and should we do anything differently? Should we ask them to hold a TKI or anything like that? These are all questions that we sat down and thought about and, and came up with, with some guidelines. And so if the patient is symptomatic, if they're hypoxic, they have cough, they have fever, they should be seen in the emergency room of a hospital. Uh, and if they're stable, they're not hypoxic, we actually would consider, we had availability because of emergency use authorization with these uh, COVID-19 monoclonal antibodies. These were um, um, manufactured monoclonal antibodies against the spike protein, which were supposed to be used in patients who were considered sort of high risk, who had developed um, a COVID-19 infection, had fever, but did not get hypoxia, need pulmonary um, support, et cetera. And this antibody could be given in the emergency room, uh, but they could not be admitted. So you give them the antibody, it's a one dose, and they go home. So the ones were Bamlaminovab or, and Kesarimivab, and these were by Regeneron and Lilly, I believe. Um, and they were actually, we used it in several patients and they were remarkably effective. The people would come in, they would be sick, they get the antibody, they would go home, continue on their TKI. And then within three to five days, they would recover pretty quickly. So we were kind of impressed about this. And so any of our patients with leukemia came in like this, who were not very ill and needed to be admitted, and if they were able to go home, we would, we would try this antibody. If they were hypoxic, if they were ill, we'd recommend hospitalization and optimal COVID-19 treatment. Continue the TKI as long as feasible, as the other speakers have said. Uh, if the patient was in a deep molecular remission or CMR, and they were very sick, we'd actually have a lower threshold to hold the, t to hold the TKI. And so those patients who may say, look, you're in, a, you're in a basically deep molecular remission, it's been a while, you're very sick with COVID, let's reduce the, the potential toxicity of the TKI. Let's come off of it, treat your COVID optimally before something you know life-threatening happens, get you better, and then restructure the TKI after that. We would watch for thrombotic complications, particularly those people who were on nilotinib and panatinib. And again, low threshold for stopping those and holding those if they were in deep molecular response and had active, uh, aggressive COVID-19. So we'd hold those if needed and really watch for thrombosis and consider anticoagulation, the whole thing. People who had pulmonary complications would really be having a discussion about what to do with their dissatisfaction, should we hold and, and whatnot. Um, when patients ask about CML who, by getting the vaccine, again, our recommendation is, is as Dr. Malhotra nicely outlined, get the vaccine. If you're eligible, uh, if it's available, get the COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, we, have, uh, we have great experience with it. There's no data that they're negative. And um, patients with prior infection with COVID-19 who subsequently recover three months, six months later, are also eligible to receive the vaccination later. So um, uh, we have been doing that, and I'm curious to hear others' experiences on, on the vaccine and COVID-19 in patients with CML. So I will now um, hand it over to Dr. Santos. Thank you. So uh, for a patient who is being treated with CML who develops COVID, I also had another case similar to this three or four months ago. Patient was in deep molecular response, being treated with imatinib and developed uh, COVID-19. So what I would do, number one, we need to remind, rem remember that if a patient, those patients with CML who, are, who have a, a profound response, they are, most of the time, they are not immune compromised, similar to patients with acute leukemia or other hematologic malignancies. So it is possible that you don't need to, uh, most, some of these patients won't have a, a severe outcome as a patient who has a, a, a less uh, severe disease, who have a more severe hematologic disease. But if the patient, despite having a, a, a CML in deep molecular response, if the patient develops a hypoxia or need for intensive care, I would admit patient to the hospital, I would get a multidisciplinary team to treat the patient, including besides the hematologist, ID specialist, and our pulmonologists, 
and I would follow local guidelines for treating COVID based on the severity of the disease, use steroids. Here in Brazil, we use steroids for patients who have a moderate to more severe disease, for patients who uh, go uh, who, who need ICU admission, we usually would follow uh, uh, ICU protocols. And I would try to maintain TKI as long as possible. I would only maybe consider to discontinue if the patient had a very deep molecular response and we needed it. And I would also monitor for TKI side effects that could increase in the presence of severe COVID. Like for example, thrombosis if the patient is getting enlotinib or pernatinib, I would consider maybe decrease the dose of pernatinib if the patient had a good response while they were on COVID. Pleural effusions which can frequently be seen with desatinib, I would also be mindful of that. And also worried about cytopenias, particularly for patients who are who have very recently started therapy with COVID, with, with uh, TKIs. So next slide, please. And regarding vaccine, uh, I fully agree with Dr. Kadir and Dr. Mahotra. All patients with CML should be vaccinated as soon as possible. And I don't know of any vaccine to be contraindicated in, in patients with CML. Here in Brazil, patients with CML, they, can, they classify as having a comorbidity that can get then prioritize for having vaccination based on their age. We have three vaccines here, CoronaVac, AstraZeneca, and Pfizer. And I would say that all three are reasonably safe and effective for CML patients. And for patients who had a history of prior COVID, I, they should wait, at least according to Brazilian guidelines, at least one month after having a diagnosis with COVID to get their vaccine. So uh, to summarize, get, get your vaccine as soon as possible, follow the guidelines, and you should be good. Okay, so scenario number four is the patient who is transforming to uh, CML blast crisis or who, or who has presented to you with CML blast crisis. So these are high priority cases. Uh, all routine investigations, including a marrow and a flow, should be carried out. Uh, our uh, approach uh, in India is to avoid intensive chemotherapy if possible. If the patient is lymphoblastic transformation, then make do for a few months with uh, TKI plus steroids plus VCR. If the patient is in myeloid blast crisis, uh, we would try to tide over the pandemic with uh, either one of the hypomethylating agents and consider aggressive treatment uh, later on when the pandemic is on the decline, if possible. Uh, and uh, uh, intensive, intensive stem cell transplant, uh, we are actually trying to defer these stem cell transplants during the pandemic period. Uh, <clears throat> For patients who are in chronic phase, uh, should be continued on second or third generation TKIs till they await the transplant, until they await the waning of the pandemic. Uh, those who are in accelerated phase may be switched to another TKI, or the dose of the current TKI may be increased. And those who are in blastic phase, uh, as I said in the previous slide, we would like to manage them medically until the pandemic eases and transplant becomes more safe and feasible. So I now hand over back to Dr. Kedia. All right, thank you, Dr. Mahotra. I think uh, the final case, CML transformation to blast phase, I think really a medical emergency and unfortunate in the, in the era and, and the setting of COVID-19. And so again, these people urgently hospitalized with cytoreduction for stabilizing their count, usually with hydroxyurea, more commonly with some chemotherapy. And so uh, in our COVID-19 patients, um, we start therapy with uh, chemotherapy and TKI as the uh, sort of the age and patient appropriate, right? So uh, I think a slight difference from what Dr. Mohota described, we actually would treat these people uh, regardless of, of having, you know, in the setting, in the era of COVID, we would treat them like emergency, newly diagnosed acute leukemias. And so we would actually consider in those patients who are younger and fit, with intensive chemotherapy with TKI. So it could be something like uh, uh, CLIA plus panatinib, which is cladribine, uh, idorubicin, cytarabine, panatinib, or FLAG plus panatinib. Or in those patients who are a bit older uh, or unfit, we may consider decidabine plus uh, a tyrosine kinase inhibitor, decidabine 10 days plus TKI uh, for their initial induction. 
and keep them in the hospital. In lymphoid blastface, similarly, in our younger patients or fit patients, we would proceed with hyper CVAD and a tyrosine kinase inhibitor, so intensive chemotherapy, you know, acknowledging that, look, there, there's going to be immunocompromised. We have to keep them isolated and, and away from COVID. Um, and then in those older unfit patients, we're actually using approaches using some of the new monoclonal antibodies, including the bispecific blinitumumab plus steroids plus TKI, which we've had really nice responses, even, uh, even in patients who are otherwise healthy. Uh, so we're, 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 we're using that in our older unfit patients for COVID-19. Uh, it, it, the, the scenario changes a bit with if the person is COVID-19 positive, again, optimally treat with their COVID-19, remdesivir, steroids, tocilizumab, oxygen, supportive care, whatever is needed, including broad spectrum antibiotics, which we have very low threshold, because although it may be a viral pneumonia, I think that uh, uh, particularly if they're about to become impending neutropenia, uh, the virus does cause significant lung parenchymal damage, which is a ripe area for development of secondary bacterial infections, including staph and other nosocomial acquired infections. And when they become neutropenic, these things are, are horrible. So we have low threshold for starting antibiotics for infiltrates that are beyond what we feel are just COVID-19 related. And so we would decide to reduce these patients. Myeloid, we give them hydrea. For lymphoid, we give them Decadron to control the blast phase until we're ready to start therapy. And, and we start therapy when they're minimally stabilized with their treatment uh, and go from there. For myeloid blast phase in COVID positive patients, this is where we would drop the intensity of the chemotherapy and consider HMA, either five days of decidabine or 10 with tyrosine kinase inhibitor. And in lymphoid blast phase, again, either dexamethasone TKI or blinitumab. And I say or because, you know, we're not exactly sure of what happens in terms of cytokine release in patients who are receiving blinit TKI while they have other cytokine release from their COVID-19. We know that there's a huge cytokine storm, their CRP is elevated, their ER, ESR is elevated. And so we were very uh, hesitant and slow with using these kind of bispecific antibodies with the cytokine release in the setting of already having active COVID. And so those patients who may do dexamethasone TKI first, and then as their COVID-19 sort of quieting down, then we may introduce the blinitumumab with the steroids or even give a mini hyper CBD, which we actually felt was more safe than the blina, in particularly in those people who had already some cytokine release going on. Uh, and mini, mini CBD, again, is very, very low dose with low dose cyclophosphamide, low dose vincristine, and some dexamethasone with TKI with excellent responses. So that was our, our approach to blast phase. Again, don't withhold treatment, even in the COVID 19 positive patients to reduce, stabilize, and then start the therapy, which you think is kind of going to be tolerated, but take it one, one notch lower. I think the, the data with Blina uh, or other bispecifics for that matter in, in people who are COVID-19 positive, who have active cytokine release is going to be, uh, is going to be interesting and slow and steady, I think is, is the name of the game. So I will go now to Dr. Santos. So thank you. Uh, so as the previous speakers have mentioned, uh, CML in blast crisis is a medical, medical emergency. I would get patients and admitted into the hospital as soon as possible and collect all lab work needed besides the bone marrow and BCR able level. If a patient were had been previously treated with TKI, I would get BCR <coughs> and also an NG, NGS myeloid panel. Now regarding therapeutic choices, we've seen there are several uh, uh, good options as I have seen from Dr. Kadi and Dr. Mahotra. I would say that uh, here for newly diagnosed, if a patient had a diagnosis of CML blast crisis had, and had not been treated with, with any TKI whatsoever, my initial TKI choice would be the Zatinib. And for all other situations, I would try to, I would prefer Ponatinib. If a patient had a myeloid blast crisis, usually most of the time I consider a hypomethylating agent like the cytobine 10 days or is a site that didn't combine with a TKI. You know, I would have used intensive chemo like flag Ida or even seven plus three combined with a TKI, but in my experience, I find that giving low intensive chemo, except for the very young patient, would be my preferred approach. Now, for lymphoid blast crisis, I usually would try to go with TKI plus steroids plus vincristine. And in some cases, you can consider getting a, a, a dose of inotuzumab. And if a patient achieves CR, I would consolidate with blinatubumab while I, I discuss with the patient uh, 
other options. Uh, next slide, please. And the other option that I mentioned would be to consolidate a patient with a stem cell transplantation. And uh, if a patient is eligible, eligible for a stem cell transplant, I would get HLA typing at the diagnosis of the blast crisis and any potential donors. If needed, I would enroll that patient on the Brazilian registry of bone marrow transplant patients to look for an unrelated donor. And in first remission response, I would consider stem cell transplant for all eligible patients. Uh, my donor choice would be, I would of course prefer a match related donor. Otherwise we would consider either an unrelated donor or even an identical donor, depending on the speed and the probability of the patient having an unrelated donor. Here in Brazil to, to search and procure for a mud can take quite a bit of time. So sometimes we, we try to go for apples because they're quicker. And if possible, I would go for malabative conditioning depending on the donor type and the age of the patient. Apples usually tend to go a little bit more mild for muds and match related donors who can increase the intensity of the conditioning. And one question that a lot of uh, colleagues have asked me if we have stopped go continue with allo transplants during the pandemic. In, when we when the pandemic started in March, April last year. We, we did have in both hospitals where I work, we did have to stop at least for some weeks so that we could develop some protocols, how to proceed and uh, what would, how we would go, do with the bone marrow collection, if we do it simultaneously with the conditioning regimen, how. So now we have developed several protocols to ensure that the collection of the bone marrow and the conditioning regimen and the transplant, uh, they are done in the most safe way possible. And due to the severity of this disease of CML blast crisis, I would recommend stem cell transplant. We haven't stopped proceeding with this, uh, having these procedures uh, in the past year. So, like, I think uh, with this ongoing pandemic, we have realized uh, what has been taught to us uh, since medical school that prevention is better than cure and prevented, prevention of COVID-19 infection in CML patients is of paramount importance. Uh, we should follow the standard recommendations of uh, masking, social distancing, and hand sanitization. Uh, as a rule of thumb, BCR over TKI is, uh, you know, maybe protective against COVID-19. And in fact, there are a couple of randomized trials uh, go ongoing in Europe, you might be interested to know, uh, which are testing imatinib in patients of COVID-19, whether it reduces the infection. So here are the, you know, uh, you know uh, trials and uh, ongoing trials of imatinib in COVID-19. So if uh, Dr. Tedia would uh, permit me uh, to kind of conclude what we do in India, like education is the buzzword, webinars for medical professionals as well as for patients, uh, teleconsult has increased by several fold since this uh, pandemic started. Uh, we are, you know, renewing patients' uh, prescriptions online now on WhatsApp or emails. Uh, we're getting their CBC done close to their house. Uh, we are sending and reviewing these CBCs on WhatsApp or email, and we are sending prescriptions back to them via the same route. In some patients, we are actually querying the TKIs to them also. And these are just, these are just some snapshots of the triage which we do in our hospital, and I think uh, the similar situation exists in most of the hospitals in the world. And you know, some pictures of the webinars and webinars for professionals, webinars for patients, which we've conducted to educate them. And if I were to, you know, kind of just give some stay at home messages uh, from our side. Uh, in fact, patients with CML and on TKI are lucky in the sense that the TKIs may be protective against the virus. So it is not that much of a big issue as patients uh, of other cancers and on chemotherapy. So newly diagnosed patients should be initiated TKI as soon as possible. Ongoing patients should be continued TKI. All efforts should be made to minimize travel of the patient. If the patient is unfortunate enough to develop the COVID-19 infection, uh, you continue the TKI till as long as possible. 
It need not be stopped in patients who have mild to moderate disease, uh, patients who have uh, uh, aggressive disease, patients in blast crisis, at least in India, um, because our transplant facilities are not that developed. We prefer to uh, postpone aggressive treatment and stem cell transplantation, uh, and we try to treat the blast crisis with chemotherapy rather than aggressive chemotherapy. And as I said right at the beginning, uh, like we're all learning, this is unprecedented times. It is extremely important to collect and share data. And the recommendations which we have given to you today are subject to change, are subject to evolution. So please, uh, you know, bear with that. And so this uh, SMS makes sense. So mask and social distancing. And I think uh, this is important to like the best home is home, the best age is courage, the best smile is smile, the best stand is understand, the best end is friend, and the best day is today. And with that, I hand over back to Dr. Kedia and Dr. Pablo for their concluding remarks. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Bohoda. That was amazing. That was an excellent sort of summary and, and take home point. I love the, the pictures. I'm definitely going to use the make SMS your habit <laughs> as one of our uh, uh, points here. But I think, you know, what we learned here, I think from all of us is that, you know, this pandemic, it's been rough, but it also has, has really sparked a lot of innovation uh, in all of our systems. We realized that maybe the way we were practicing, we can always improve on it, particularly with telemedicine, with the, the great innovations using WhatsApp and email for the prescriptions and sending prescriptions and you know, allowing people to stay home more. I think, um, you know, you really summarized it nicely. Um, I am I'm fascinated by this data that you presented with the TKIs maybe pre, uh, allowing prevention of COVID. I didn't really know that data very well. So I'm going to look, look at that a little bit closely and I didn't realize that was the case. But I want to thank everyone uh, on the webinar and uh, I don't know if Dr. Santos has some closing remarks, but uh, thank you everyone. Well, I thank you, Dr. Kadir, Dr. Mahoto. It was a fantastic webinar and I, I feel that the pandemic has changed the way that we practice medicine and I think it's for the better, actually. And moving forward, several of the changes that we implemented during these times, I think they're going to stick with us for a long time. So thank you, all of you. And I'd like to thank Total Health for inviting me. And I think it was a great session.